assigned. Uh, there's no known copy that exists today. So here he actually explains that we, we tried searching for it. I don't have a copy. We don't have it. Uh, and the Japanese also apparently had, had also wrote in, in the same file to say that we don't have it either. So nobody knows who has it. Um, uh, in terms of what the National Archives of UK has, so um, there are many War Office files that, that cover the kinds of uh, discussions that the War Office had leading up to uh, the war as well as uh, some of the post-war issues. So one of the things is the War Crimes Trials file. So here is a statement by uh, Elizabeth Choi where she talks about uh, uh, um, her experience uh, as part of the Double Tenth incident, which uh, Gracie had earlier pointed out. Um, and, and she talks about how uh, the beatings were not... So let me see if this thing works. So yeah, the beatings were not uh, part... Uh, were not the, most, the worst part at this stage. It was the constant kneeling throughout the day, day after day, that hurt uh, me. So she describes the kind of prolonged uh, torture that she was being subject to. Um, other records from the National Archives of UK include uh, these, this war map. So I'm sure Mr. Mark will have a lot to talk about this, so I shall not embarrass myself here. But basically, these are, these are a set of uh, maps that document the, 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 the British defences uh, over, over the course of the Malayan campaign as well as the battle for Singapore. So all these are actually available for viewing on archives online. You can actually zoom in to view the high-res versions. Uh, Okay, um, moving on, so British military administration files. Now, these are files that were left behind um, by the British military administration. So as Gracie has mentioned, it was a very short-lived uh, six-month um, um, military administration that happened after the Japanese surrender. Um, there are over 300 files in this particular collection. So a lot of things that Gracie had mentioned, the published reports, those were the published items. So those were the, the sort of processed things. But these files are the, I would say, the raw materials. Like they were the day-to-day -day correspondence that the British military administration had received uh, over the course of their six months. So they're really very um, detailed. So they're, they're files that go on to like, uh, uh, claims from, from so-and-so. Uh, there are like two, there are certain files that are like 200-page like um, collections of letters that they received on uh, wartime uh, compensation, for instance. Uh, so, but um, it, it reveals the kinds of uh, issues that the DMA had to deal with in the post-war years, and actually a lot of the letters that, that were sent in uh, sort of cover uh, and sort of reveal what life was like uh, under the Japanese occupation. Um, so some of the examples that, that I'll bring out, so for instance, uh, the case of uh, Mr. Joseph Francis, uh, he was caught during the double tent incident as well, um, and he was tortured by the Kempetai for over six months uh, for, on the suspicion of you know, smuggling information to the prisoner of war. Um, and uh, he was tortured for six months, and then he was released on the street, so his brother wrote in a letter together with uh, a little, uh, his, his, his driver's license here. So he was actually working for the Japanese uh, as, a, as a driver, um, and uh, he died in May 1945, unfortunately, um, and, and in, in this letter above here, which is currently on display at uh, the former Fat Factory, um, his, his friends actually wrote in uh, describing the horrors of inhumane punishment and the tortures that actually reduced him to a living skeleton. So there are all these really very personal and very uh, heart-wrenching stories that emerge from otherwise um, seemingly administrative as well as a very um, um, nitty-gritty kinds of administrative files. Another example uh, that, that showcases some of the um, uh, uh, sort of different perspectives or diversity of experiences of people under the Japanese occupation. So we all know of the Indian National Army and the, the, the vast number of people who actually uh, volunteered to sign up for, for this particular army to fight for India's independence. But yet, at the same time, there were also many who uh, resisted it. Uh, so for instance, we have here a letter that was sent by a former uh, surveyor at the Tengah Air Base. Uh, he writes in, in the post-war period, explaining um, how he was imprisoned in Sumatra uh, for the rest of the occupation because he refused to join. Uh, he talks about how... Um, he will, uh, uh, I was, okay, he, he says down here, I was the only educated Indian, of course we know he's not the only one, but uh, he, I was the only educated Indian who refused to join in the INA. Why did I refuse it? Because I strongly believed in the victory of the Allies. So he, he talks about you know, how, how, how strongly he had believed. Of course, he was writing to a British military administration after that, so uh, these things must be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, but nevertheless, I, I, I mean, he as well as many others who refused to join the INA, they, they were often uh, subjected to quite a lot of uh, torture by the Kempeta especially. Um, in the post-war period, of course, we all know uh, how the banana, mo banana note suddenly became uh, worthless overnight. Uh, so here we have a letter who, by somebody who talks about how uh, his money, his British currency became uh, worthless overnight. And then later on, his Japanese currency became worthless overnight. And then so he's asking, uh, he's basically asking on behalf of his father, 
uh, whether or not uh, can we change the currency back. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the the so the so he talks about you know how he has eight thousand dollars of British currency and then suddenly he he cannot uh, when the Japanese occupation started suddenly it became worthless and then when the British forces has come in Singapore he's not in a position to change his currency and he cannot work he's being he's old so what can he do and unfortunately the reply from the British military administration it is regretted that it cannot be exchanged as Japanese currency was not recognized as legal tender so unfortunately all his money became worthless again. Um, okay, so moving on from apart from all these paper documents, uh, we do we do acknowledge that um, there has been uh, I mean there's a gap in, in terms of what official records there are available, and uh, this is a comment. Uh, this is a, a quote from um, one of our first directors of the National Archives, Mrs. Lee Tan. Uh, she talks about how um, the National Archives had begun looking at uh, collecting uh, paraphernalia, oral histories to fill this official gap uh, back way back in 1985 when when we published um, this particular publication here. Um, so one of the ways that we do that is through our oral history collection. Um, so we have over 300 interviews under the Japanese Occupation Project as well as the Prisoners of War Project. But of course, made, uh, because we use a live history approach in our oral histories, so actually a lot of uh, accounts of people's experience under the Japanese Occupation could also be found in other projects such as, um, for instance, uh, Communities of Singapore, uh, whereby we interview uh, uh, community leaders of, of various uh, race and creed. Um, in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the exhibition at the former Felt Factory, we also do feature uh, oral histories quite heavily. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, so instead of hearing me talk, why don't we have a listen to some of the people who talk about some of their experiences? Huh? Okay. They start 10, 10 firing squad on the top of us. The order came and then they just shoot. Bang! Then the second time they shoot, prank up to around about three times like that. So those who died will fall down. So I was hit on my knee. Suddenly I remember, look, I'm still alive. So when the first man dropped dead, I follow him, you see. Automatically I follow him. I had that presence of mind, you see. So I just follow him on the top of you. Then the third man come cover me on the top again. Then it covers like that. So automatically like a toy soldier going down like that. Isn't it? So I control my breath. I do not make any movement of my body. So there's no sign of anyone alive. So they are not sure to be to make sure that all are dead, they gave a third firing. Another Ten rounds, boom, like that, finish. Then they have no time, they cover with a, a plank. And then they go to the next group and so on to another next group. And it finished in 20 minutes time. It's finished already. Everything is finished already. So this is actually an account, a rather harrowing account um, from Mr. Chang Chen Yen, who was uh, the, the Malacan um, Volunteer Forces. Um, so during the Sokching period, he was, uh, he was uh, singled out for his, um, his involvement in, the anti in fighting in the war. And uh, he was brought to uh, Siglap Hill, I believe, to, to, to get shot at. Um, and he talks about how he escaped the shootings by just falling down as, as you know, corpses were falling under, uh, on top of him. And uh, later on in the oral history account, he actually talks about how he climbed out under these corpses and, um, and, and sort of hid a while before he went back home. So there are all these very harrowing first-person accounts that you will hear uh, in, in, our, in our oral history collection. Uh, actually I actually have more, but um, since I'm in the librarian's world, so why not uh, play an account from uh, one of our pioneer librarians, uh, Mrs. Hedwig Anwar. So here, um, so apart from talking about their experiences during the Japanese occupation, um, something quite interesting is also to see how they reflected upon um, this particular experience. And here we have an account from uh, Mrs. Hedwig Anwar how she uh, reconciles her, her difficult experience um, as a Eurasian, because uh, Eurasians were, were, were sort of like persecuted during the Japanese occupation as they were suspected of, um, of, of being pro-British, uh, and um, how, how she reflected on, on this particular experience under the Japanese occupation in the post-war years. How she gradually has learned to forgive. For a long time, I didn't want to go to Japan at all. You know. and, and I didn't go to Japan until 1966. And I was there for a week 
Then I met a lot of Japanese, and they told us about all their experiences during the war, you know, their, their shortages of food, the bombings and all that. And of course, uh, we knew about the atom bomb, and we had seen pictures uh, of the, you know, the survivors and so on. So um, I realized then that, you know, they had suffered perhaps even more than, than we had, you know, to some extent, and that it was the war group, you know, the military group that had uh, power over the civilians, and so the civilians also had had suffered, you know, as much as anyone else in the war. So my view of them changed. Okay, so these are just some of the examples of our orange tree collection, but of course you can explore more uh, on our archives online database. Um, so with together with this oral history collection, we also started collecting a lot of private collections because as people talk, sometimes they remember that, oh, I used to have this you know, identity card, I used to have this passbook savings. Um, um, past books and, and they, they came to us. Uh, there are also, of course, more collect, uh, more targeted drives that we have conducted over the years. So we have here some of the, the ones of 1980s. So some of our some of our younger colleagues here, uh, featured here um, um, in the Heritage Week drives and National Museum. Um, just last year, we also had a uh, uh, sorry no two years ago we had a public call for archives. Um, yeah. Um, so some of the items that we have collected in the, the recent one, uh, this is an example of a, of a graduation a yearbook of the Chinese Military Officers Academy. It was donated by a 96-year-old gentleman who actually came down uh, to respond to our call for archives, and um, he donated this. this uh, he loaned us this treasured uh, possession of his for, for display at the at the uh, exhibition at the former Fort Factory. He actually fought. He enlisted in the the military in China and fought in the Sino-Japanese War, and it sort of show, showcases how. Um, uh, the locals in Singapore were actually, uh, Malaya were actually uh, tied up in, in wars that, that, were, that were beyond beyond our borders. Um, in terms of Sukching, so uh, we also have uh, some so another item that we received in the in the public hall recently um, is uh, is one of these uh, registration cards. So you have a the oral history account of you know how people escaped the Sukching, but those who who were screened uh, sometimes were let off, and uh, they will get this this particular stamp here if they were let off. Um, and this particular one was donated by, by his son, uh, Ao Peng Hong, who, who sort of describes how his father had explained to him how um, he was spared because he was too fair. And uh, he wasn't seen to be a, a threat to the, to the Japanese uh, uh, who were screening him at, at a particular station. Um, we also have a lot of oral history accounts that talk about how when they received this, this particular stamp, they were either hold this piece of paper very dear to themselves or sometimes they got they didn't get stamped on any piece of paper or any identity card at all. They got stamped on their hand. And we have an oral history account of how someone says that he, he, refuses to, he refused to wash his hand for the next uh, couple of days because he never knew like, when he would be forced to show that he was successfully screened and, and you know, be spared uh, death. Um, in terms of uh, personal records, so Gracie earlier on mentioned uh, the census cards. Uh, and and um, so I'd just like to point out that some of these items actually show the, the kinds of uh, change and continuity in administration. So we see some of the um, uh, birth certificates that were, that were issued during the Japanese occupation. Now this was actually based on the exact same format uh, of the British colonial administration period. So they basically reused the forms. A lot of times, a lot of the, the Japanese administration uh, officers basically just reused whatever forms that were issued uh, during the British colonial administration. But at the same time, there's also continuity and change in terms of um, uh, how the, British re the returning British military administration continue to use some of the things uh, that were used by the Japanese administration. So for instance, the census card, the census card system was actually something was introduced under the Japanese administration. It was imported from, from a similar system that they had uh, used back in Japan, whereby all the households had to report the number of uh, residents within each of the households to the police station. Um, so this allowed them to keep track of, of, the, of the population they were governing. Um, you see this one here, uh, very prominently, BMA is written on it. So when the British military administration returned, they actually continued to use this, this, these census cards to uh, take stock of the people who were living under their administration as well. Um, in archives, okay, this is a pun on the archival term fonts, but I don't think many people will get it. Uh, so fonts are basically, uh, it's a French word for a collection uh, that, that's used in the archival community. So we are very fond of personal collections and in our exhibition, we actually try to, uh, um, we could have easily like sort of split up a lot of these personal collections into each of the thematic uh, um, um, showcases that talk about, for instance, uh, here we have uh, paperwork, here we have uh, life and death under Japanese occupation, we have education, we have money matters, but we have these little red color showcases 
um, to highlight individual stories of life under Japanese occupation. And uh, this is our, our way to, to, to thank um, the donors over the years uh, for, for, for giving their personal items um, and, and uh, sharing with us their oral history uh, surrounding their experiences under Japanese occupation. Uh, so I feel like we do need to do a little pitch for the <laughs> exhibition at Vermont Ford Factory. Uh, so I'll just show, quickly show some photographs of some of the items that we have on display. Some of the items uh, which Gracie had mentioned, you know, the maps that from Mr. Lim Shopping's collection, we do have them here. So we, we are presenting a lot more original artifacts in this uh, update, in this uh, revamped uh, exhibition. Um, some, of the some of the items sort of tell a very personal, uh, sort of uh, harrowing story. So for instance, this is actually a shellac recording of a of an uh, um, anti-Japanese song um, that was uh, commercially released in 1939. Um, you notice that, okay, like you can't really see very clearly from this photo. Sorry about my poor photo taking skills as well. Um, so here you actually see that the title has been defaced, uh, presumably to avoid uh, being detected uh, while well, the owner had it during the Japanese occupation. Um, we have also introduced more infographics as well as tactile interactives to help younger children uh, com understand, comprehend um, uh, such complex information such as timelines. Uh, here we have... Uh, a Sorry, my photo taking skills are really non-existent. Uh, so this is uh, this is actually an uh, infographic um, from from one of those Chosabu reports. So actually, the Japanese administration um, in 1943 had sent down um, some economists and statisticians down to their occupied ter territories in Malaya um, to collect a lot of information. So that included information on the population, what the population was eating, what kind of substitutes they were having. It was really really detailed, um, and you know what kind of industries. Basically, their their, their conclusion was that the industries are all collapsing. Um, uh, and, and so this is actually one of the, the findings that they had about you know, what, what kind of food people were eating back then. Um, and then below here, we have a little tactile interactive of how much a dozen eggs cost over a certain period of time. So, uh, you know, if you open up this tin, you will see 50 cents in February 1942. That was how much a dozen eggs cost. By September 1945, it was $432.50. $400 for a dozen eggs. Um, we're also having more uh, multimedia uh, projections as well as uh, standalone stations to feature some of our oral history collections and audiovisual materials. So uh, the, the oral history account that you heard from Mr. Chan Ching Yen, uh, you hear it, uh, you, you get to see it within this, this particular uh, uh, projection that talks about um, the experiences of people who went for the Sokshin screening and how some of, the, how some of them had escaped um, 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 that, that tragic fate. Okay, so with that, I will end my presentation and thank you very much for letting me get crashed on everyone's world. Um, if you have any comments or questions, this is the time for you to share with us. So we are opening up to the floor for any qu questions or comments that you have for both Gracie and Fiona. Can you talk about the, the Japanese dating system? I noticed there was one slide earlier on where I think the year was like 2-5 something or 2-6 something. So what, what is it dating from? Okay. Uh, so actually, I always like to say that whenever we study this time period, right, we need to know like three sets of dating systems. So there's the there's a 2602, 2603. I, I think it's the Koki or Nengo. I can't remember which is the one. Um, so there are two sets of Japanese kinds of dating system. I can't remember if it's the Koki or the Nengo. But 2602 means 1942. 2603 means 1943. Then there is the Showa dating system, which is uh, based on the reign of the emperor. So Showa 17 is 1942. Showa 18 is 1943. So on and so forth. Um, if you're looking at the, Jap uh, the Chinese language sources, you will also have the Republican year system. So it's like the Ming Kuo something, something. So you just add nine. So it's... Uh, it it basically starts with 1911 as the year one, and then you just add on accordingly. So there's, there's always a lot of complex dating systems that, that you have to grapple with. You know, it will be very good at maths when you do this particular time period, I feel. <laughs> uh, hi. So uh, I understand that during the Japanese occupation, there were a lot of, like, uh, I would say, like, efforts by the Japanese to, like, so to say, indoctrinate the local Singaporean population with the Japanese culture. So they open up many, like, schools to teach the, Jap uh, the children Japanese. And I just want to know, like, what are the general perceptions that the Singaporean, lo Singa Singaporean locals had towards these, like, programs that they introduced? Like, one of them was a nan Nanto Soke program, where they recruited a lot of, like, teenagers to, and they even sent them overseas to Japan. So many of them seem, like, quite convinced, quite, like, how I say, um, quite good programs. Uh. So I just want to know, like, what the population's perception towards it was. We have over 300 um, oral history accounts. Um, so uh, some of them, of course, 
uh, and they, they, they showcased a variety of experience. I mean, there were those who were interned in, in certain camps. Um, Eurasians who were interned in, in camps as, as children. There were some who talked about how basically life went back to normal after, after the initial period. La. Like, they, they started going back to work for the Japanese uh, administration. Um, some of them studied in, in Japanese language schools. But I mean, so yeah, it really depends on who you were. Um, what were your experiences during that particular period of time? Certainly some of them uh, benefited by, by, by being offered chances to go to technical schools, to learn certain um, trade skills, for instance. Uh, some of them um, obviously did not do as well, uh, especially if, if you know, they had lost family members in the, in the Sok Cheng and other things. So uh, there are really a diverse, uh, diversity of experiences uh, to be had uh, under, under that, that, that three and a half years. So it, yeah. Can I have a listen at the oral history collection and, and see whether there are there are any of those that, that reflected those that you're interested in, which is um those who had uh, who had um, other learned skills and, and things like that under occupation use. All right, thank you. I I, I just have a question. You know, you record the range of experiences um, of the people of Singapore during the the Japanese. Um, what was it, was it is it easy or difficult to um, ascertain the degree of uh, collaboration um, you know people who who collaborated with the Japanese actually because we interview people who live through the occupation so it's not that difficult to find accounts uh -huh. of how they had worked together with the Japanese administration I, I mean I wouldn't use the word collaboration but um, yeah it's, it's, it's easier to find accounts of how they had work together with the Japanese rather than... I mean, we do have some, some more prominent accounts of resistance fighters. So we have uh, some interviews with, uh, for instance, the Force 136 members. Uh, quite a lot of them, actually. Uh, Tan Chou Ong Ti, uh, Tam Sien Yen, uh, Ha Se Sun. Yeah, so we do have quite a few of those resistance fighters as well. Um, but in terms of you know, daily life under Japanese occupation, then actually we turn to those who had managed to live quite peacefully through, through the occupation years, and many of them um, have been working for, for Japanese, uh, either the, the civil administration or for certain uh, Japanese butai and companies. Yeah. Maybe you can, I, I just want to quickly, I don't want to waste people's time, but maybe you can ask the uh, Chinese Chambers of Commerce, because my, my grandfather actually had to uh, work with Dr. Lim Boon King mm. in the overseas Chinese. He was actually in charge of uh, Endao mm. and dealing with all these uh, people sent up to Malaya. So, um, and the thing is, I think that uh, at that time when, when my grandfather was alive, and especially with some of our relatives in OCBC as well, um, I, perhaps, you know, you could ask them because they have a, um, that kind of degree. But it's quite difficult somehow to elicit more, um, you know, ah, especially okay. during the planning, you know, and, and things like that, because there's a political dimension which. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, I see. I see where you're coming from now. Like how to get them to talk about that, yes. that particular, um, if if they don't wish to share, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we do get a bit of that, and it's not just it's not just the politically sensitive kinds of memories. I feel that uh, when we talk to, I mean, when when I listen to a lot of the oral histories, especially from females um, who lived through the occupation, there's this there's also this uh, reluctance to talk about um, the kind of gendered violence that happened is always couched in very um, vague terms. So I think there are certain memories that, that are hard to, to excavate, especially through, through oral history, um, not only because of the political sensitivities, but sometimes it's also uh, because there's a, there's a more personal gender dimension to it as well. So there are, there are all these gaps that I think neither the official records nor the oral histories can fill. And um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Thanks for that. <laughs>